Welcome to The Primal Shift, practical approaches for primal living in a modern world. I'm your host, Shabi Ibrahim from The Ancestral Body. Today, we have a very special guest presentation by Dr. Zishan Ardain. Dr. Z worked in the Accident and Emergency Department of Box Hill Hospital before making the switch to general practice. He has also completed a master's in public health and tropical medicine at James Cook University and has been practicing for 10 years. Dr. Z currently also works as the head doctor for the Melbourne Demons in the AFL and has a fierce passion for the role of diet and nutrition in weight loss as well as the prevention and management of diseases such as diabetes, cholesterol disorders, high blood pressure and heart disease. Z's journey is also a very personal one of transformation where he went from 110 kilograms in April 2010 to 82 kilograms by August 2011 and until this day. He has a very keen interest in the ketogenic element of the paleo and primal lifestyle. His talk today is entitled Nutritional Ketosis. So why not make yourself a cup of tea, kick back and enjoy this very interesting talk. Thanks Shabby. Oh, well, thanks everyone for coming out this morning on a Saturday morning to hear a couple of talks. So, quick show of hands, who has heard about nutritional ketosis? Okay, pretty much the whole room. Who has tried it themselves? Okay. So, I'm going to give a bit of a background to this today and then we'll go through it. I'm a bit biased because this is the way I sort of go about my own health, but uh, here we go. So, quick overview. So, I'll just have a quick quick bit about myself, then a bit of a background to um, basic metabolism, biochemistry, talk a bit more about what is nutritional ketosis, some of the possible health benefits, uh, its relation with exercise and exercise performance, um, and we look at some, maybe some of the criticisms of ketosis, and then I'll give you a quick rundown of my last three weeks in ketosis. Okay, so a bit about me. It's there's me and my wife. Uh, so yeah, as Chavi said, graduated in 2003 from Monash, GP, got a master's in tropical uh, medicine and public health. Uh, so I work, work a few different jobs. I work at uh, South Yarra as a GP. I also work in a sports clinic in Albert Park and I was uh, the doctor for the Melbourne Demons this year. So their performance on the field was nothing to do with the medical <laughs> care. <laughs> All right. So. As Chavi mentioned, so I was around 110 kilograms probably what, three years, three, a bit over three years ago, and then made some changes and got down to 82. And I sit in about the mid 80s at the moment. My sort of sporting background is uh, I like to do a bit of sprinting because it's over very quickly, and <laughs> there's some of my times there. Uh, that's me at work, working hard. Okay, though. That's a bit of a difference there. So that's me in uh, 2010, around April, and this is a selfie that I took in my bathroom <laughs> earlier this year. Uh, ketosis doesn't get rid of hair on the chest. That's, <laughs> the that's courtesy of waxing, but that's a different talk altogether. So my journey wasn't just waking up one morning and going, oh, I'm going to do ketosis. It took a long time. I, I cut out sugars and I plateaued and I went to starches and basically experimented with myself, did some reading and basically found myself in a position where, you know, most of, most of the time I can w- maintain my weight. That's uh, another photo because I'm in love with myself now. So. <laughs> okay, so we'll get on with the talk. So a simple graph here. Um, some of the graphs and pictures I will use are probably a little bit of an over-representation, but if you look at what happens to your blood sugar level um, after eating a meal, you can break it down to seeing that carbohydrates generally spike your sugar level up like that. Protein, you know, depending on the amount you eat, a bit slower. Fat generally keep things pretty stable through there. So that gives us a bit of a background to three, three of the micronu- uh, macronutrients that we eat and how it affects our blood sugar levels. So if, if we move forward here, um, Basically, this is a representation of a cell in your pancreas. So it's meant to be your bloodstream out here. So when you've got a lot of, uh, after you eat and there's uh, sugar in the bloodstream, it comes through, in through this channel here, into the cell, 
Um, I'll get back to all of this stuff in the middle, but basically the end result is that insulin from the pancreatic cell is released out into the bloodstream to do its, to do its job. And at a cellular level, if you look at the membranes, what happens is insulin comes along and binds to this receptor, and that receptor basically does a bit of magic and lets the glucose basically come through here from the outside of the cell, inside of the cell. Okay, uh, there we go. So what happens to glucose? Um, it can be used up by the cells, as Ken showed us earlier in the last presentation. It can also be stored as well. So it gets stored as glycogen in the liver and gets stored as glycogen in muscle. Now in muscle, once it's stored, it can't be released back into the bloodstream. It's only for the muscle to use. So in effect, the more active you are, you know, you can store more glycogen in there. Um, the glycogen in the liver, however, can get released into the bloodstream as dictated by, um, by needs of the body. So this looks a little bit complicated, but I'll break it down for everyone. So this is a representation of a fat cell. Um, and we look at the role of insulin in fat storage and fat mobilization. So triglycerides, which are basically three fatty acids of the glycerol body come into the fat cell and that's uh, enhanced by, the, by uh, the presence of insulin and insulin also brings glucose into the cell as well. So a process known as lipogenesis uh, connects with the fatty acids and basically gets storage of, uh, uh, of fat, of triglycerides in the, in the fat cells. So if you, if you can see one fat cell as a representation of the entire body, Basically, the more, the higher the insulin is and the more glucose you have, basically you're going to end up storing excess, excess glucose as, uh, as fat in the fat cell. Now, insulin also suppresses the role of certain hormones like uh, highly, um, HSL and adi adipocyte uh, triglyceride lipase, a hormone-sensitive lipase there, which are involved in breaking down the triglycerides back into the bloodstream. Okay, so hope, hopefully everyone's still with me at this stage. So what is, what is energy and wh what's the big deal about energy? So energy expenditure, basically most of the energy expenditure that, that, the, that we go through in 24 hours, so most of it is just to maintain our, our bodily functions. So things like breathing, uh, liver doing all its processing, all the, all the functions of daily life that really aren't under conscious control. Most of the energy basically uh, is used for that. Uh, some of it is physical repair of tissues and, and cellular damage, uh, and there's growth repair as well. So if we break it down, um, you know, what society generally focuses on a lot is exercise and how much more we can do to um, expend energy and we sort of focus on exercise. But the reality is exercise makes up quite a small amount and NEAT basically refers to your non sort of non-exercise activity so you know walking around in the morning sitting around watching tv all these sort of things so that gives us the background of that exercise yes it's important but not in terms of the, the burning of the calories that that society sort of talks about a lot okay so what how is energy produced at a cellular level so you've probably heard of something called atp or maybe you haven't uh, essentially atp is uh, it is adenosine triphosphate, uh, without going into the biochemistry, basically it's reduced into adenosine um, ADP and inorganic phosphate is cleaved and that releases energy. So this happens at a cellular level in all, cellular level in all our cells, basically for us to have energy. And you need, you need this basically all the time um, for all those things we mentioned. Um, so if you look at it in a little bit more detail, inside the cell, this happens basically without oxygen. Um, so glucose is converted to pyruvate, and from there you can you get two um, ATP, and then you get a buildup of lactic acid. So that happens when, you, when you're going for a sprint or you're doing something that requires a lot of uh, intense energy. Inside the mitochondria of the cell, you get this uh, pyruvate becomes acetyl-CoA, and from there basically you get the Krebs cycle, and you get 30, 34 ATP. Fatty acids can also contribute directly to this as well. So you've got a setup inside the cell where energy is produced. 
Now this graph didn't come out as well and it looks a bit busy, but this is just another way of looking at that. Uh, this is in, in the cytosol, which is not in the mitochondria in the cell, and this pathway to get to pyruvate, and from there it goes in the Krebs cycle, which I never learned properly yet a, as a medical student, but I find myself interested in it now. Um, you know, it basically goes round and round, and you get production of, of this energy. So uh, getting a grasp concept of that gives us a bit of a background on where we go into nutritional ketosis with this talk. So we just shift over to the brain. So the brain's about 2% of our body mass as an adult, uh, and it takes up about 20% of our uh, energy expenditure just going about its, its daily jobs. It's, a, it'll, it's a probably a lot higher in young children and, and infants. Um, now, conventionally, it's thought that most of the energy that the brain requires for cellular function and to form ATP uh, is derived from glucose. Um, Although there is emerging evidence that the brain can use um, lactate and perhaps even fatty acids to a small degree, it's always been thought that only gluc glucose is the only substrate that the brain can use um, for its functions. Um, so roughly this can convert to about 100 to 100 grams of glucose per day, obviously depending on the size of the individual. Now coincidentally, this roughly can translate to about a, the same amount of um, glucose that's stored in the liver as well. So you can see a little bit of a problem here is, yes, we can make a little bit of glucose through gluconeogenesis, but if we're not getting enough glucose in our diet, or if, we don't ha if we're not getting enough glucose, the brain won't be able to function after it exhausts all its uh, glycogen reserves. So basically, if you were to starve yourself and only drink water, you'd only expect to survive three or four days before, you'd, before you die. Now, we know this isn't the truth. People can survive for months and months at a time without um, eating. Um, so there must be something else to this picture here. So this is where ketone bodies come in. So ketone bo bodies are formed in the liver um, from an e from and they basically are converted to aceto aceto I can't even say that acetoacetic acid and from there that's either converted to acetone. Now acetone ladies in the room will probably know that nail polish remover one of the ingredients there. So it's highly volatile, so the body doesn't really do much with it. So it's expelled either in the, in the urine or it's, um, uh, you breathe it out, so it's exhaled. So the so-called ketosis breath that some people supposedly uh, have noticed. Now, this can also be converted to beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is basically, it's not technically a ketone body, but for the purpose of this talk, we'll call it a ketone body. And that is a substrate that the brain can actually use. So what happens here in a, in a representation is fatty acids are converted here to acetyl-CoA, and from there, if there's not enough pyruv pyruvate from, um, from glucose, you can have, um, and in the absence of high amounts of insulin, which we demonstrated from, if you have not much glucose, not much insulin, you get acetoacetate formed, and that forms beta-hydroxybutyrate. Now, beta-hydroxybutyrate can actually um, become a substrate for the, the TCA cycle is another name for the Krebs cycle. Beta-hydroxybutyrate can actually become a substrate and the brain can use it as energy. So a little bit complicated, I've thrown a few graphs at you, but the bottom line is if we go back to our, this graph here, before I talked about glucose entering, becoming pyruvate, and then from there going in the mitochondria, forming part of the Krebs cycle and producing uh, ATP, beta-hydroxybutyrate can actually come in here as well and go straight into there, into the TCA cycle. So now we've established that the brain can actually use glucose and beta-hydroxybutyrate as fuel sources. So that, in essence, is what we sort of like to achieve in nutritional ketosis. Now, the other organs can use beta-hydroxybutyrate as well, but if the brain can only rely on glu glucose, not fatty acids, it preferentially shifts to the brain. So to summarize that, in nutritional ketosis, we have limited carbohydrate supply. So there's only a little bit of glucose in circulation. Um, you get protein supply, which is good because you get some sent off to the muscles rather than breaking them down. And then triglycerides or form free fatty acids, which can be used by muscles and can also go to the liver and be formed into ketone bodies. And that can be used as fuels for the brain. So the question is, 
how do we achieve nutritional ketosis? So, roughly to achieve, uh, there's, to get into nutritional ketosis, there's a lot of individual variation. So, I base this basically a little bit on myself, but about carbohydrate restriction to about 50 grams per day, um, and that may vary for the individual. Now, the key element in nutri nutritional ketosis as opposed to maybe a paleo template is making sure that protein doesn't make up the bulk or a large proportion of your intake as well, roughly to about 1 to 1 1.5 uh, grams per kilogram of lean body weight because as we saw from the previous graphs, protein raises the level of blood glucose which in turn um, raises insulin which also suppresses the activity of uh, nutritional ketosis and basically you eat fat until you're full so I don't like to talk much about calories but if you look at an example here um, that's a good breakdown there of how much fat protein and carbohydrate you may want to eat to achieve uh, ketosis and how do you measure them well if you're very diligent or, or a bit obsessional as my wife would say you can get one of these uh, glucose or ketone strips and you just do a, a, a blood prick and that basically picks up the beta hydroxybutyrate levels um, in your bloodstream and you can check it at various times of the day. After a while you probably get a good feel for where you're at and it's probably not necessary. Uh, this is taken from a book by uh, Volek and, and Finney and it looks at um, levels where you define nutritional ketosis. So they generally say 0.5 to about 3 is uh, um, you're in a state of nutritional ketosis, but around 1.5 to 3 you probably get sort of more optimal zone. And a lot of people confuse ketosis and ketoacidosis. Uh, ketoacidosis is right here on the other end of the spectrum, and that's in a, in a special type of people, so type 1 diabetic. So that the way the metabolism works is quite different, and I'll touch on that a bit later. But you know, almost com comparing ketosis and ketoacidosis is like, I think, comparing a drizzle and a hurricane, you know. Maybe they're on the right, same spectrum, but they're, they're poles apart. All right, so just summarizing that again, dietary fat or fat stored in fat cells goes to the liver, gets turned into ke ketone bodies, can be used by the heart and the brain and the muscles. So. People often say to me, well, if I measure my ketone levels and I, and I know my ketone levels are, are good, does that mean I'm automatically losing weight? Uh, it's not necessary because you can, you can use the fat in fat cells or all the fat that you're putting in, in your diet can, can actually just go all to the liver and you may not need to use much from there. So it's about finding a balancing act. So it's not, about, it's not as if if you eat all the fat you want in the world and and it'll all be, yes, it'll turn into ketones and the brain will use it, but it, the body might not necessarily have to break down fat stores to do that. Uh, in reality, it's hard to eat that much fat. You know, you get, you get a bit sick of it after a while, you get full, you don't actually eat that much, so the body does actually break down its own stores. So Ken touched on a lot of this stuff earlier in the talk, but if we look at a lot of our modern health problems, um, so diabetes, fatty liver, atherosclerosis, hypertension, stroke, and all these other guys, well, cancer, asthma, sleep apnea, gallbladder degeneration, they're all sort of linked in with, you know, you'd call them metabolic disease clusters, and th they've all been associated with obesity in the past. And the thought was, is it, convention conventionally they thought getting fat or getting overweight, getting obese leads to these things. So they often thought, all right, it's all about calorie imbalance, which leads to being overweight, which leads to these metabolic uh, clusters. But I, I, I think it's actually whatever drives the obesity is driving all these other things as well. So I don't think it's anything to do with the amount of calories and things you eat. So this cartoon here shows us what happens in the pancreas. So a lot of you guys probably already know this. So you're eating too much stuff that releases uh, with too much sugar in the bloodstream. The pancreas basically has to make more insulin to clear it. The cells basically there's only so much glucose they can use at a cellular level and they basically become resistant um, to what the pancreas does in response is goes, well, we may have to make more insulin to try and get that sugar out of the bloodstream. Um, and then eventually you get pancreatic, so you get burnout of the pancreatic cells and that eventually leads to diabetes. 
Obviously, there's more factors involved, but this is a simple representation of what happens. So hyperglycemia can basically lead to all of these things. Uh, dysfunction of the mitochondria, oxidative stress, inflammation, um, and a few other things. Increased ages, so that's accumulated glycation end products, as, as Ken mentioned, um, so advanced glycation end products. So that's basically, a lot of people think that is really the hallmark behind the aging process. Um, and this graph basically summarizes a lot of those things as well. So back in the, you know, the 70s, they used to say, or well in the early 80s, too much saturated fat leads to cholesterol, which leads to heart disease, simple as that. And I'm sure a lot of you guys are probably across a lot of that. But there's a lot of factors in play. So insulin resistance leads to all of these things, which probably, as Ken mentioned in the last slide, uh, in the last talk, lead to atherosclerosis as well. So looking at the health benefits of ketosis now, Ketogenic diets were actually used historically for a long time, since the 1920s, um, typically for epilepsy, in epilepsy treatment for kids with refractory epilepsy. Um, and it worked quite well until about the 1930s and 40s when it went out of favor when anticonvulsant medications came in. And uh, establishment thought, well, it's easy to give someone a pill to stop um, epilepsy. So this diet went out of favor. And interestingly enough, I. I was speaking to a, a neurologist recently and I, I mentioned the ketogenic diet for epilepsy treatment and he goes, yes, we still use it for children in controlled conditions. And I said, what about adults? And his statement was, oh, it's not really used for adults because, yeah, you can force a kid to eat a ketogenic diet, but which adult's going to stick to this? <laughs> so I found that really interesting that there was no pathological reason behind it. It was more just, nah, adults won't do it. So, so there's, there's kind of strong evidence for um, ketogenic diets for uh, these um, things, these uh, diseases here. So we sort of touched on a diabetes. So hopefully going through those graphs and, and tables that I showed you, if you're not only relying on glucose as your fuel and you're eating, using beta-hydroxybutyrate and fatty acids as well um, to produce energy, um, the need for glucose Externally, it's not going to be high because Ken mentioned the body can make glucose if it needs to. Um, and then you don't go down that path of insulin resistance and, and being in this cycle as well. So weight reduction, it's basically you, you mobilize your fat stores because of the low levels of insulin. Um, there are other factors involved there, but that's the main one. Now, interestingly, there is good evidence for cardiovascular risk parameters, even though people and, and a lot of my colleagues who, who, when I talk about my diet with them or my, my lifestyle, I talk, tell them that most, most of the energy I get is from fat intake. They go, well, you know what? You may have lost weight, but you're probably going to have a heart attack soon because they're still fixated with that, that, that doctrine that fat leads to cholesterol, which leads to heart disease. Whereas, as Ken expanded in the last talk, uh, LDL particle size and triglycerides numbers are actually reduced on a, on a um, and epilepsy we mentioned as well. Um, emerging evidence, so uh, cancer treatment, I'll touch a little bit on that as well. Now neurological disease is an interesting one um, because we talked about the brain using beta-hydroxybutyrate as a fuel. It's all often seen as a cleaner fuel, a more efficient fuel and it it actually is less excitable. Like the, 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 nerv the nerve cells seem to be less excitable and there's a less likelihood for, we've talked about seizures as well, but there is emerging evidence for the use of um, ketogenic diets and neurological conditions that are, that are um, known to be um, autoimmune, such as MS, um, prevention of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, and the whole spectrum of these. So uh, there's a lot of evidence coming out and a lot of studies being done. Um, and it'd be interesting to see where we go down that path because Alzheimer's disease sometimes is sometimes called type 3 diabetes which is an interesting term I heard a few years ago but um, often you know there's correlations that people with diabetes have higher rates of uh, Alzheimer's disease and I, I think it's probably the insulin resistance and, and the, the excess glucose that affects the neurons just as much as the other cells. Um, acne is another one um, probably because low insulin states are less inflammatory, um, in, in 
high insulin levels and insulin resistance promotes in inflammation throughout the body um, and acne is an inflammatory condition as well. Polycystic over ovarian syndrome, which seems to be getting uh, more prevalent in society, is a type of insulin resistance in women. Um, similar mechanisms at a cellular level um, for, for uh, adva advantages there. Um, just talking about weight loss, so this graph pretty eloquently summarizes what happens with fat breakdown, the lower, the lower the level of your insulin. So it's not actually a linear progression, it's actually you know, a, a graph that actually, you don't have to, lo you lower your l insulin levels a little bit once you're at the bottom end and you get a lot of uh, shift in your fat breakdown. Whereas down here, where uh, people that are on a high carbohydrate diet, uh, you typically see them, they, they go out, they go out, they hit the gym for an hour, then they smash down to Powerade straight afterwards and just replenish the energy they've burnt, which is stored glucose, rather than mobilizing their fat stores. Um, but yeah, we'll touch on the exercise a bit, a bit later. Um, this is a, a, l a look at cancer, and I find this very interesting, um, particularly in its potential um, for cancer treatment. So as we looked back at the, going back to when I mentioned the Krebs cycle, so in cancer cells, particularly um, brain cell tumors, there's some evidence, um, it's called a Warburg effect, that basically says that the mitochondria are a bit uh, defective in cancer cells, so they don't they don't really, they're not able to work very well to produce ATP. So a lot of it, a lot of the energy production of a cancer cell comes from this pathway here. Glucose forms pyruvate, forms lactate, and, and then they get the APT production there and that helps them proliferate and grow. Um, there's a lot of, ins there's a higher amount of insulin receptors and insulin like growth factor receptors on cancer cells and they basically lap up all the glucose that's going around in your circulation. If you're in, a, in an induced transition where you're in nutritional ketosis, there's a lot less uh, glucose um, in circulation. And you, you, if you're relying on beta-hydroxybutyrate, which in a normal mitochondria can enter into the Krebs cycle and produce energy, it doesn't seem to be able to do that in a cancer cell. These pathway steps here get blocked up. And in, in, in doing that, uh, so y in being in ketosis, sorry, your normal cells are getting a substrate for energy production, whereas with really low levels of gl glucose in circulation, you're effectively starving a cancer cell. And there have been some documentation of um, people with um, brain cancers using a ketogenic diet to basically shrink the cancer and, and starve the cancer. Um, obviously, a more study has to be done on this before we can you know, say it's going to solve all cancers. But it, to me, at a cellular level, I find that very interesting. All right. so. We'll get into a little bit more of the fun stuff of the talk now, because uh, you've probably seen enough graphs and tables and charts. So ketosis and how it relates to exercise performance. So that's, that's me in uh, ice skating, and this is before a very serious race here, <laughs> uh, which we won't say who won. OK. So to summarize, um, because we talk about what ketosis does. So a couple of questions I have to ask. Does ketosis enhance aerobic capacity? And that's probably likely. Does ketosis enhance anaerobic power? Probably unlikely. And enhance muscular strength? Probably unlikely. And does it enhance muscular endurance? Probably likely. And I'll go through a little bit about that. Now, having said no and unlikely here, I don't necessarily think it hinders uh, these aspects of, muscular um, of exercise performance, particularly after a period of adaptation. So again, if we break down uh, types of exercise, so there's a process called direct phosphorylation. So if you have to do maximum effort exercise for just say, you know, a duration of 10 to 15 percent, you can produce a bit of ATP for energy just by this process here. Um, for all other anaerobic mechanisms, so energy between uh, energy expenditure for about 30 to 60 seconds, it's basically done in the cytosol, so not in the mitochondria, and usually use glucose as a substrate to form pyruvate and lactic acid. So we've all heard of the term, you know, lactic buildup when we go for a sprint and then it feels like it's our legs are aching. Um, that produces ATP to form that function. So in this setting, you can see that glucose plays the main substrate. Now, we do, in, even in a ketogenic state, you will have circulating glucose um, and you can use glycogen that's stored in muscle. 
but if, if this is sort of all you're after, the beta hydroxybutyrate is probably not going to play much of a role in here. In anaerobic exercise, which is your typical cycling or your long r r running events where most of the ATP production happens in the mitochondria through the Krebs cycle, yes, it can come through glucose that forms pyruvic acid or pyruvate and then enter the, um, the Krebs cycle, or it can come from fatty acids directly through beta phosphorylation and amino acids if you br break down protein, but that's not ideal. And we also know that in the, in the nerve cells, uh, the neurons, a beta hydroxybutyrate can form part of that. So in that setting, a ketotic, a ketotic state can actually um, help exercise performance. And I'll explain that in reference to hitting the wall. So who here has ever run a marathon? Who here wants to run a marathon? It's not much fun, especially when you train for it and it's 30 degrees that day, but I won't talk about that story. So I ran a marathon in 2008. Um, before all of this came along uh, and it took me about five hours and I hated it but I hit the wall at about the 32 33 K mark and really struggled to get to the end um, before the race I just thought yep I know about the wall I'll be fine I just will myself out of it you know I was a bit naive about the the uh, what happens at the cellular level so what happens when you hit the wall basically is you run out of the stored glycogen so the muscles use all the glycogen, and the glycogen from the liver is released into the bloodstream, and basically now muscle and brain are competing for the same fuel. And basically, when your brain realizes it doesn't have fuel to, to function, it just tells you to stop. So it's not so much that your muscles are getting tired. You get hit the wall, there's not enough glucose, your brain just says, stop, I don't want to do this, and that's hitting the wall. Um, and yes, you can, tr you know, you can train yourself uh, elite athletes obviously have bigger glycogen bases or they don't spend five hours running a marathon, they do it in two and a bit, so they often don't hit the wall. So the analogy I like to use is if you think of a fuel truck um, running out of petrol, so that's what hitting the wall is like. In its own petrol tank to get the engine going, it's run out of fuel and it's got all this, all this petrol in there, but it just can't access it. And that's basically what I think uh, people are like that are, are dependent on, on burning glucose as their fuel supply and exercise. They've got, you know, if you go to a start line of a, of a marathon or a fun run, after you see the elite people go, you look around and think, geez, these guys are going to run 10Ks? I don't think so. There's a lot of overweight people because they're not using their fat stores as energy. They're just using glucose that they replenish. Now, people often say, yes, you can, you know, you can take gels and drinks and things when you're running, but then... The, then you're putting energy into the actual digestion of this and breaking this down too. So a lot of runners get gut issues and they get GI distress when they're running and they just can't keep up with the demand quick enough. So the analogy takes further. So if you're, if you're a fat burner or you're keto adapted and your brain's actually getting enough beta hydroxybutyrate, then whatever glucose you do have stored as, uh, as glycogen it doesn't all have to go to the brain. Some of it can go to the brain, some of it can go to the muscles. And also, if you're mobilizing fatty acids um, and ketone, bo ketone bodies as fuel, basically you can get all the way up to here. Because even the most lean person has a lot more fat um, stored as energy than glycogen. So it's like starting a race with two different types of fuel tanks. If you're relying on glycogen, you've only got, you're almost near empty, um, whereas on fat, You've got all these calories and all this energy that you can uh, burn. Now, the other interesting thing about um, adapting to a keto ketogenic state is what's called the respiratory quotient. So if you're purely burning um, carbohydrates, so if you're 100% carb burner, the amount of oxygen you breathe in and the amount of carbon dioxide you breathe out is the same. If you're fat adapted, so if, you, if you're only using fat, fat, fatty acids as a fuel, you actually have a uh, respiratory quotient of 0.7. So it means for every one unit of oxygen that you breathe in to get, uh, and that's because oxygen is required in the, the, the formation of AD, from ADP to ATP to ADP, and then carbon dioxide is a byproduct, um, you're only producing 0.7 carbon dioxide. Now that's important because there's two drivers of how fast we breathe. One is if we don't have enough oxygen 
And if we have a lot of carbon dioxide build up in our blood, we want to breathe faster to get rid of that. So if you're producing less carbon dioxide, which in turn is reducing your pH less in your blood, you basically don't have that air hunger. You don't have to breathe out as fast. So basically, you can be a little bit more efficient with your exercise in at anaerobic states. So summarizing some other um, advantages. So if you're keto adapted and you're a fat burner, basically, normally you have an improved body composition. So in exercise, you've co probably got a better body to weight ratio, which is going to prevent injury and probably make you a bit more efficient. Um, if you're having it, it, it's protein sparing as well because you're, um, you know, you're using fatty acids mainly and you're getting enough protein in your diet anyway. And you get a steady and sustained fuel supply for brain. And I think that's the key. If your brain is being fueled up, your muscles can use other substrates there. Um, keto adaption decreases the amount of lactate production, better pH control and respiratory function that I mentioned in the, in the respiratory quotient section there. Improved insulin sensitivity, and you're going to have less metabolic stress, less generation of uh, um, ROS, um, and this is high. This is Hufa refers to highly unsaturated fatty acids in cell membranes. So if you have a lot of reactive oxygen species, or, or free radicals as they used to be called, they're going to they're going to react with the cell the uh, unsaturated fats in the in the cell membranes, and it can make them unstable. So basically, this translates to faster recovery, less exercise-induced inflammation, less immunosuppression, less GI stress, muscle damage, and soreness. Um, so quickly looking at some of the common criticisms of ketosis, and a lot of these double up with ketosis, with uh, criticisms of paleo that I'm sure a lot of you guys have probably copped as well. Um, so a lot of people just say, oh, yes, the weight loss is just mostly muscle and water. And yes, at the start, that may be true to a degree because you, you're reducing your glycogen uh, levels in your in your liver and stored glyc stored glucose in, it needs to be done with water as well and that may be at the start but then when you start mobilizing fatty acids it's not so much that case. The other thing, carbs are critical. We've been eating carbs for years. I think Ken sort of touched on that in the last talk as well. So there aren't any. There's no such thing as essential carbohydrates and even though glucose is a preferred substrate. For for a lot of our uh, cells, we can make glucose quite adequately. Just because we need glucose doesn't mean we need to eat it. I mean, we need cortisol for survival as well, and you know, but we don't eat cortisol. Um, so, saturated fat raises cholesterol, which causes coronary artery disease. That's probably another talk in itself, but it, you know, yeah, we could talk about that for ages. But basically, it's a very simplified form of rationale that says A equals B, which equals C. Um, a doesn't equal B, and B doesn't equal C, so does it, it's irre ir irrelevant. And, and I'll talk about that at the end, about going back to that question of what do I say to people. Uh, ketosis is ketoacidosis. So ketoacidosis is a state that happens in type 1 diabetics, and sometimes very, very late stage type 2 diabetics. Uh, but in, t in type 1 diabetes, basically the pancreas can't make any insulin. So what happens is none of the glucose gets into your cells, um, so ketone bodies are formed. But unlike nutritional ketosis where there is a feedback, feedback loop that if ketone bodies get too high, insulin actually is secreted from the pancreas and that controls the ketone levels and basically you can make more glu glu glucose. So basically they're quite different. Uh, this is a, a disease state. In ketosis, you don't have a drop in the pH in your blood um, and any of the other symptoms. Missing micronutrients. So this is of, often a hot topic. They often say, well, you're not eating enough carbohydrates to get in all your vitamins and um, all the other uh, trace elements that you need. Now, and often people that are on keto ketosis, uh, ketogenic diets think, well, they better supplement with this and that. Now, we often forget about organ meat. Um, now, if you eat a piece of liver, you're going to get more than enough micronutrients than a lot of supplements and a lot of vegetables. You're going to get more vitamin C in, a, in, in, in liver than oranges. And, and it's so densely packed with the micronutrients that um, you know. traditional societies almost used uh, skeletal muscle as the last source of, um, of, of, of meat intake. They used to go for the organ meats first because 
instinctively they knew that it had the micronutrients they needed. So that's one of my rebuttals to that. Now short term versus long term, um, you know, people say yes, a lot of these disease states may be um, beneficial in the short term, but what happens if you're in a ketogenic state in the long term? Now, I don't have any studies to talk about that. I've only got cases, so if you look at the Inuits and a few other um, cultures around in history, they're probably in a ketogenic state for a long period of time, obviously without knowing it, and um, there are some examples there. Um, red meat causes bowel cancer. Um, this is a, another thing that people talk about. They think, well, if you're eating all this fat, you're going to be eating a lot of meat and you're going to be getting bowel cancer. And look, one, you don't necessarily need to eat a lot of meat to be in this state. And two, I don't necessarily think red meat causes bowel cancer. A lot of the studies that were done um, were poor studies and red meat included things like sausage rolls, pizzas and a lot of processed foods. Um, so another talk for another time will be interpreting sci scientific studies. Kidney disease, it's often been postulated that high protein diets can cause kidney disease because the kidney gets overwhelmed with uh, dealing with all the uh, uh, products of protein. Now, again, this is not a high protein diet and there's still a lot of debate about whether that's actually true, um, that protein will cause problems with the kidney. Um, certainly, I wouldn't recommend high protein diets for people with underlying kidney disease, but again, this is not a, a high protein diet. And the big one, socially unacceptable to eat in this way. Um, it is difficult to eat out and socialize uh, and stay in ketosis. Um, unlike a lot of people that follow a paleo template where there are you know, 80, 20 rule, it's a lot easier going out on a weekend and going, well, I know for this meal I can you know, eat whatever I want and it doesn't really matter. At the start of um, going into a ketogenic diet, it doesn't take much to knock you out of ketosis. So I've been experimenting with this on and off for about a year. Uh, and when I first started going into ketosis, I found one, one poor meal or one meal with too much uh, carbohydrate or, or protein would knock me out of ketosis for quite a while and take me quite a few days or even up to a week to get back to a level where I wanted to be. These days, I'm probably a lot better at, lot, lot better at it. Um, for example, and I'll touch on what I did in the last three weeks, but went out to dinner recently with a bunch of friends and I had what I thought was the most ketosis-friendly ketosis meal was a barramundi that's cooked in a lot of soy sauce and obviously a lot of sugar and, and uh, carbs there. Next morning I was out of ketosis, but it only took me another day to get back in ketosis. Um, and I was probably not even fully out of ketosis. So, yeah, it, that's you know, individual variability. But yeah, people often say, look, for years we've been talking about eating disorders and ca calorie counting and all of this is not good for our health and now you're talking about ca counting carbs and counting ca ketosis and all of this. So look, yeah, that's something we can talk about, but yeah, neurotic people can find their, find their way here as well. But look, I don't think it's socially unacceptable to eat this way and um, I'll talk about it a bit more at the end about what you can do to people or what you can say to people that, that um, criticize your way of eating and really want to bring you down. All right, so <laughs> to end with, I'll just look at the last three weeks that I spent um, in ketosis. So my wife and I went on a holiday to New York and Mexico in August. Um, so obviously wasn't tracking my ketones and it was very difficult to, I was probably eating more in a paleo way without necessarily being in ketosis, which was fine. Um, weight was a little higher when I came back, so I thought, let me, let me document leading up into this talk where I am. So what I did every morning was measure my weight uh, and my fasting blood sugar levels and ketone levels uh, using the blood strip. And then in the evening before going to bed, I'd measure my BSL and ketone levels. And basically you can see that, you know, weight goes up and down. So I don't think weight's always a great proxy of how successful you are with ketosis. A lot of factors like if you've exercised heavily the day before, your muscles are going to be repairing, there's going to be fluid, there's going to be inflammation there. That'll put your weight up and down. Up and down. So in those, well it's not even three weeks really, whatever it is, two and a half weeks, weight went from about 86 to about 84 and a half, back towards where my baseline is. And you can see a lot of my fasting levels in the morning uh, were pretty low, uh, the lowest being 2.1. So if I had a, a blood sugar level of 2.1 and I a doctor saw that, they'd think I was about to have a hypo and probably go into a coma soon. 
all of these were asymptomatic. Um, and these measurements here at the end, uh, most of them were taken shortly after dinner, a couple of hours after dinner. Uh, the highest reading of blood sugar I got there was probably 5.8. I think I had some berries that night, I can't remember. But all of these levels here, which are not in a fasting state, would be acceptable in a fasting state. So conventional wisdom says your blood sugar level can go up to about seven and a half, two hours after eating, because you know, because that's just the way it is. But I, I, I beg to uh, postulate that keeping your blood sugar level stable, even even after eating in this way, is probably more beneficial. You don't get the release of insulin. Um, so in a graphical form, because everyone loves graphs. So there's one outlier here, which I'll explain in a moment. So this is my morning levels, and you can see a really good correlation here that when glucose levels were a bit higher, you'd probably see a bit of a dip in my, in my ketone levels. When ketone levels went up, um, blood sugar levels went down. So that basically means that I'm fuel partitioning a bit better, so I don't need as much glucose if ketone levels are low. So basically together they're providing my me needs. Now this, this, this here was a pretty high level of ketones, 5.4 one morning. Um, that was a bit of an accident by me. Uh, the night before, I made an omelette, and I was using a bit of uh, MCT oil. Usually, I put a tablespoon in there. I was lazy that day. I didn't feel like getting a tablespoon. I thought I'd just measure it out by the bottle. Obviously, I, I went a little bit overboard, um, and that shot my ketones up the next day. MCTs are basically medium-chain triglycerides. Um, and the way they work is they basically get shunted straight into the bloodstream and can be used by the liver and converted to ketones without the whole process of being broken down, reabsorbed. So basically, it's like five minutes. Yeah, it's like uh, you know, quick fuel for the body. So that was that. Um, and then going across here to my evening levels, and this you can see again the correlation between when there's a spike in ketones, when there's a spike in glucose, there's a drop in ketones. Um, yeah, you can see that it varies a fair bit. So based on that chart that I showed you before, you wanted to be, be above 0.5 to about 3, or really I, I'm sort of aiming for at least above 1 to 1.5. So most of my ketone levels in the, mo in the evening were you know, representative of that. So the question is, what did I eat in this period? Now, I didn't get a chance to take any photos of my cooking, but this is a list of what I found that I ate during that time. So, you know, it's not just a matter of having a high fat diet, it's about eating the right fat and the right quality of fats, which I probably don't have to stress to, to you guys because you guys are probably all on top of that. So eggs, a um, bit of bacon, not as much as you know some people, uh, mushrooms, avocado, beef, lamb, lamb liver. I seem to tolerate dairy okay in small amounts. I had some double cream, strawberries, ghee, broccoli, cauliflower. Uh, butter, coconut oil. I basically cook all my food in coconut oil or ghee. Um, so a bit of fish, smoked salmon, the oil that I mentioned, and occasionally I'll have some almonds, macadamia nuts. Uh, so that's pretty much what I eat. I noticed I didn't eat any chicken in that period. That just, you know, I don't eat as much chicken anymore, but that's just probably coincidence. So that's pretty much what I ate. Um, and some of the observations from that, I basically ate one to two meals a day, probably closer to two but usually one to two meals a day. No hunger on waking, so I never felt hungry when I woke up. Most of the time I'd, I'd wake up, go to work. If I, was, if I had a chance, I'd have lunch. Um, other times I wouldn't. For example, the day before yesterday, I had dinner at about nine o'clock. Uh, yesterday, I ate for the first time at about seven o'clock in the evening. Uh, and that included going to work and socializing and whatnot, and I wasn't hungry at the time. So occasional snacks. Yep, I just have a I just eat butter straight straight off. Um, it's not for everyone, but <laughs> or even coconut butter. But nuts, berries, and cream I'll have. There was no no counting, like of calories or, or macronutrients. Like before, I showed you the graphs of percentages of how much fat or 50 grams of carbohydrate. I didn't measure anything. I just had a feel for it, and you just play around a little bit. Um, and you can actually feel when you're in ketosis, I think. You, you get a bit of a feel for it, just the way you function. Uh, you feel a lot sharper as well, I feel. Um, in this period, I, I did regular exercising. Uh, so weight training, a bit of sprinting, play futsal, uh, cycling. I had no tiredness or fatigue during that period as well. And 
Um, look, I'm not an elite athlete, so it doesn't really matter in terms of you know, if this is the right feel for at an elite level, but for, for my function, it was fine. During that time, I had long work days. I haven't had a day off since I got back from overseas, which was uh, uh, the 20th of August, but anyway, <laughs> this is my first day off. Um, I went to Spanish classes. There's no deterioration, concentration, or mental function in that time, even without going a whole day without uh, eating. So often I'll see 20 patients in the day. Every 15 minutes I'll see a new patient, and you're talking and you're concentrating, um, and didn't have any problem without eating breakfast or, or any of those sort of things. So I think that's basically it. Uh, that's me in Barbados. Uh, <laughs> the water's a lot deeper than that, so I wasn't about to have a head injury. <laughs> uh, if I did, I could go into ketosis and repair my nerves, maybe. <laughs> um, so that's basically an overview of nutritional ketosis. I know it was a bit bogged down technical at the start, um, but hopefully you got a bit out of that.